Hello, and welcome to Meet Our Ex's Success Story podcast. I'm host and coach Amanda Lea, and I'm psyched to meet and speak with our guest today. A farmer and a feminist activist, she's writer of many books, The Vegetarian Myth being one of my most, definitely the most impactful for me personally, and I can only imagine how many others her story has inspired to seek the truth in nature and in our health. We're so privileged to have you here with us today to discuss your diet success story with our audience, Lierre Keith. Hi, thanks for having me. And this is my dog, Jamie. He's a Hi. great Pyrenees, the giant dog. So, he likes to be on the interviews because he has one thing to say, which is eat the meat. <laughs> I love it. Hi, Jamie. <laughs> Hi, Lierre and Jamie. And I love Jamie's message. <laughs> all right, let's dive in. Okay. <laughs> so please tell us all about your now infamous um, diet <laughs> and health before you began eating the way you currently do. So I um, became a vegan when I was 16. Um, and I did that because I... Even as a very young child, I was somebody that was very concerned about um, animals and the earth and injustice. And I felt very keenly that we were doing terrible things to our planet. And I, it was very obvious to me. Um, and I hated all kinds of cruelty. And then when I met, I met another teenager who was a vegan, her whole family, they were really into being vegan. And I, that was it. I was convinced. It seemed really obvious that that was the right thing to do. So within two weeks of knowing her, I was, that's it. I'm going to be a vegan. And it was very compelling because, you know, they, they offer you this one-stop shopping. If you just do this one thing, you stop eating animal products of all kinds, you will save your health, you'll save the planet, you'll save animals, and you'll save all these poor starving people who need food. And who could say no to that? So I tried it, um, and I did it for 20 years because I'm that kind of a crazy person. Um, and I destroyed my health. So, uh, yeah. Do you want, do you want like condi the details on all my conditions that I. Sure. We'd love yeah, to okay. hear a little bit about, <laughs> about what that destroyed health looked like. Oh uh, yeah. So pretty soon into it, I um, immediately got blood sugar problems. Um, and I didn't know what that was. I mean, up till then I had never experienced it. So here I am a teenager, I'm 16 and I'm, it's, it was like every three or four hours I, suddenly had to put food in my mouth or I was going to die. Um, and now I know what that is, that, you know, that your brain can only function in a really narrow range of, of sugar, blood sugar. And when you eat any kind of carbohydrate, and you can call it complex carbohydrate if you want, but at the end of the day, it's all simple sugar. That's what happens in your intestines. It's broken down into simple sugars. Um, and then what happens is uh, your insulin level, your, your sugar levels spike in the blood. Um, and that's a biological emergency. So your pancreas gets the message, oh no, you're going to die. It's too high. And they insulin to the rescue. So there's this huge surge of insulin and insulin grabs onto all that sugar and takes it out of your blood as fast as it can, shoves it into cells um, for storage, put it out of the blood as fast as you can. Well, it's a very blunt instrument. It clearly we're not meant to do this because what happens next is, uh-oh, too low. And that's the moment I was feeling over and over again too low. If you don't eat, you're going to die. Because in fact, you are. If your blood sugar is too low, uh, your brain, you know, just goes into shutdown. So you've got to get it back up. So that means eating again. The problem on one of these plant-based diets is that it's not protein and it's not fat. It's just another kind of sugar. So now you're back up the roller coaster. Uh-oh, too high. Pancreas, insulin, take it all out. Uh-oh, now you've crashed too low again. And that was my life for 20 years. Uh, it started probably every, I don't know, three or four hours, with like having that terrible feeling. But by the end of it, it was just semi-constant. I mean, it's like every 20 minutes I had to put food in my face um, because of that. And I didn't know what it was. It just seemed normal. And I think that's part of the problem, too, is that, you know, my whole world was made up of people who were eating the same way that I was. We all thought it was normal that you have to eat every hour, every 20 minutes, like just constantly putting more little carbohydrate treats into your face. Um and now, you know, if I go to, you know, various whatever social events, like you can always tell who are the people who are still eating that way because, oh, no, they'll even say, oh, my blood sugar, I have to eat. It's only been an hour since my last meal. I'm like, I forgot what that was like. You feel terrible all the time. And here's these poor people who still haven't figured it out. And like, 
yeah, I know what you're eating because every hour you've got to put more food in your face. Like I can go all day and I'm not even hungry. I certainly never feel that terrible blood sugar low feeling. So that I did right away. That was within a few months of becoming a vegan. It was already just starting to collapse, but it took me a long time to figure out what it was. I didn't have a name for it. It was number one. Um, a few months into it, I stopped getting my period. Um, and I understand that now at the time I had no idea what was going on. And that went on also for a good 20 years because I just didn't know. Uh, and the explanation there is that um, all of your hormones are actually made from cholesterol. So cholesterol is like the mother substance. It's um, the building block of all of your hormones. And it's a really life-affirming substance. Uh, you need it for it like everything in your body needs a little bit of it. Uh, one of your, the liver, one of its main jobs is actually to produce cholesterol. But you do need to eat some too. Like your liver just can't provide all of the cholesterol that you might need to be alive and to be healthy. So what happens is if you don't have enough, uh, your body will shut down some processes to keep you alive moment to moment. And what that looks like in the human body is, well, you're clearly starving, which means you're not really in any condition to have a body or be, have a baby. So we're going to shut down the sex hormones for now. You don't really need those to just stay alive. We're going to do everything else you need to stay alive. When you get some more food, you let us know, and we'll start making some sex hormones again for you. So this happens um, to women who are on low-fat diets. It happens a lot to women who are athletes, and it absolutely happens to women who are vegans. It's really, really common in the vegan world. We all just assume it's kind of normal somehow. I don't really know how we jump over that one, but, I mean, it was a game I played in my own head, so I know that you can somehow make this make sense. And I did talk to doctors about it, but none of them ever asked me, well, what are you eating? Like, it's just not information that they have particularly. So it just was a mystery. And then I stopped being a vegan. <laughs> and the big one was I stopped eating soy too. Um, after I, I started eating animal products, it got a little more stable, but it was still kind of wonky. And then I took soy out of my diet. And two weeks later, and this is not an exaggeration, two weeks later, no soy, two weeks, boom, I got a period. And Literally, until menopause, I never missed one. And this was after like 20 years of, oh, I don't know, eight months, 11 months, six months, like 13 months, like just nothing, you know, and like this completely bizarre schedule. And then it was like clockwork, 28 days, you know, for a decade and a half, just boom, boom, boom. Like I was, it was amazing. Like it could not have been more dramatic. So I did all that to myself. I also got, got uterine fibroids which is, um, you know, fairly common amongst middle-aged women. But I know that the soy and the um, really inappropriate vegetable oil fats probably had something to do with that as well. So I did that. Um, that's no fun. Uh, the big one is that I destroyed joints in my spine. Uh, and that was two years in to being a vegan. I started to get this really awful sort of semi-constant pain um, in my spine and nobody knew what it was. And it's like this huge long process to get a diagnosis because I was way too young and they just simply weren't running the right tests. Eventually, of course, it all came clear. Oh, look, you have degenerative discs in your spine. So it's at five levels. It's a grade four derangement, which is as bad as it gets. And now they look at like my MRI and they'll say things like, wow, were you in a massive car accident? Did you fall off a roof? Like, what did you do? Like, no, uh, the nutritional equivalent, I was a vegan for 20 years. That one doesn't get, you're not going to get those joints back. The joints are very poorly vascularized. So once you damage them, it's, it's really hard. Um, I do have a lot less pain now from eating a more appropriate human diet. So I got some of my life back, but I'm always going to live in really bad pain and I'm always going to have constraints on my physical capacity. So that, that one's just, it's just, it is what it is. So I did that. Um, and then a lot of the other things I had were that sort of constellation of uh, mental and emotional, like your brain just isn't functioning, right? So I had uh, depression and anxiety and, oh, just like that, where there's no bounce in your brain. So, I mean, if I couldn't find my house keys, I would literally be lying on the floor crying because I couldn't find my keys. And that's just not, like, that's not normal. Not really. If you're in that bad, like there's something wrong. Like you need help at that point. And really what I needed was some animal products because A, the neurotransmitters are all made from amino acids. So that's protein, um, particularly tryptophan, you know, makes serotonin. And there's just not any way to get an appropriate amount eating only plants. 
So it's a big problem with people who eat vegan diets is that depression, anxiety sort of acts as, um, and then the other problem is even if you have all of those little um, neurotransmitters, the receptor for the neurotransmitter is made from fat. So eating a vegan diet, you don't have either of those things and your, your brain just isn't going to work. So that's what I did. Um, uh, it didn't take long eating a more appropriate diet for all of that to just be resolved. It's wow. sort of like, you know, the, the veil is ripped from your eye. You're like, wow, like I can see colors. Like life is good. Like what was my problem? Like, it's all fine. And I, yeah. And the interesting thing about that one is like, it doesn't take long for me, like times when I've been away from home, like at a conference and they're not feeding us appropriate food. And I, you know, have to go like, you know, 24 hours or something without really eating. Um, that comes back really fast. I'm amazed. Like I remember once crazy story, but it had been like 26 hours since I'd had anything to eat. And, uh, I was in an airport. I was on my way home from you know one of these events and, I was in like one of the, it was a smaller airport and I was in a little spoke. So there, there wasn't anywhere to get food. And I was literally back in, I was lying on the floor of the airport crying. And I finally just pulled up, like, why are you crying? What is wrong? Like, what, there's no reason to cry. You're fine. I was like talking myself out of it. And like, all of a sudden it just hits me. Like, it's because you haven't had anything to eat for 26 hours. Like, you know, maybe if you had never been a vegan, you could go a few days, honestly, and not eat and you'd be fine. But you did some damage in there. Like, you're just never going to have like the full human amount of resilience that you probably should. So the problem is you need to find some food. You will feel better in 10 minutes and you know it. So just find something. It doesn't matter what. And there really wasn't anything good because, again, it was a small airport and a little spoke and they were going to call the flight. So I just had to grab something. But I did, of course, feel better in 10 minutes, like instantly better eating some peanuts or whatever was like, oh yeah okay what in the world was i crying for but that was daily life i mean that was just hour by hour it was like that all the time that's crazy. years you just think about the no, I, no I could have done with my life and instead it was like oh, i can't manage anything so anyway that those were my main complaints people get other stuff too but that was what i wrecked yeah wow it sounds awful and the worst yeah. part not even knowing that this is something that you have a handle on. Like when you had that aha moment in the yeah. airport, I mean, at least at that moment, you're like, oh, wait, I can impact this. But I for know. all those years that oh, you yeah. had no idea. Wow. And so, okay. So you started experiencing changes, but how did you, how did you determine, okay, I need animal products? How did you even <laughs> make that switch into the way you eat now? And we'd love to yeah. hear more about the way you eat now, of course. Yeah. So the, for me, it, I was like the last holdout in like my really small sort of friendship circle and broader circle. No, but like in my, you know, sort of little group of, of real friends and family, it was like, I was the one who was like, I'm not giving up. My sister also was a long-term vegan 12 years. I think she did it. And she had long since given it up. And she, a number of tri times tried to say to me, you would feel so much better. And I was like, I can't, I won't have it don't tell me this, you know, like I just completely refused it because there are cult like elements to this. I mean, let's just say it out loud. I'm not calling veganism a cult, but there are cult like elements and anything where you can't even engage with information should tell you like you're in a fundamental mindset. Like it's not healthy to ever be that closed off, especially when it's something like your health. There's no reason not to listen. Absolutely. information information cannot hurt you like just engage and i couldn't because it, it's too threatening so I have to interrupt though but I, yeah. I have to ask one question how did sure. you because of that cult like mentality and your sister was already vegan how did you manage with your sister when a she chose to walk away from that but b when she was then trying to ask you to consider it yeah how did you manage that there was definitely tension you know and it was all on my end because i was being a jerk um, so for me, it was like, oh, well, you know, she thinks she has to do this. I'll just grant it. But I don't believe that that's true. You know, it's just some people think that's true, but it's not really true. And if people just did it right, you know, they would feel better. And of course, my health is spiraling down the drain at this point. But I see people online say that all the time. Well, you're just not doing it right. And I just have to laugh. Like, yeah, that's like the last holdout is you're just not doing it right now. In fact, they're probably doing it exactly right. And this is the end point. So, no, it was hard. And so I just kind of set it aside. Like, well, that's just what she said she has to do. So I'm just going to let her do it because I don't want to have a constant fight with my sister. But, you know, she had already given it up. And a lot of other people in my life, 
you know, it's the same deal where it's like, well, I guess I'm a vegetarian, but you know, twice a week they're eating meat. I'm sorry. I don't call that vegetarian. Like, that's just like, you're not, a, like, give it up. It's not working, you know, but at the time, like you're, we're all still clinging to this identity. So yeah, my last day was like, you know, it's in so much just the exhaustion, the pain, the depression, all of it was so bad. Um, and I went to see somebody that I, I really respected who was a, like a Qigong healer, which is a form of traditional Chinese medicine. And of course they have a totally different framework for health and for how to diagnose problems and what it all means. And I went to see him because I was really hoping he'd be able to help me. And in the back of my mind, there was this sort of terrible thought of tell you that you have to eat meat because I had already been to five or six different acupuncturists for all of these problems. And they had all said that to me, like, you know, you can't really. And I was like, no, I don't want to hear it. There must be something you can do that does not involve eating. And some of them were really blunt. It was like, there's only so much I can do. You're not willing to change what you eat. It's yeah, you can try the herbs. You might feel a little better, but it, this is over for you unless you, and I was like, no, I can't hear it. So anyway, I went to see him and, uh, He's a really, really sweet human being, just really kind, very wise, you know, way older than me, had been doing this his whole life. He's been a healer and he's such compassion. You know, he, they go to take your pulses, which is their basic diagnostic tool. He just stared at me in complete horror. Like there is nothing here. You have no chi, you have no energy in your body and you're so young. Like this is, what are you doing? He was so kind about it. He's like, what do you eat? I was like, well, I don't eat. He's like, oh, do you have a religious belief? And I was like, it's way bigger than that. It's everything. It's the poor animals and the earth. And I don't want to be the bad person. Who's and he's like, listen, big fish, fish eat the little fish. Like, it's just how nature is. And I was like, but I'm not a fish. I'm a human. And I should be able to, to decide that I'm not going to hurt anyone. And he's like, it's not life. It's just, it's not how it is out there. So that was it. I went and I ate. I had to do it. And so I, on the way home from that appointment, I mean, I cried quite a bit. And on the way home, I just thought, well, I'm going to try it once. I'm going to get a can of tuna fish because I don't have to cook it. Um, and it doesn't even have to touch my dishes. I can eat it with a plastic fork out of the, out of the container. And uh, it won't disturb the purity of my kitchen. Um, and I'll just see. And if it makes me feel better, then that's, it's a win. And if it doesn't work, then I can say, ha ha, I tried it and it doesn't work. So either way, like it's, it's, you know, but I just have to do this. And honestly, it was the hardest thing I ever did. It really was. It was so tremendously difficult to open that can of tuna fish. And I didn't even want it in my kitchen. It was like such evil that a dead animal was, you know, there in my kitchen. It really feels that way. I mean, it's such a taboo. You just build up such this revulsion to this, to any animal based foods. It was really hard. So I had a plastic fork and I was like, all right, here we go. And I was like, just moment by moment, it's all right, we're doing it. And I took that bite and it was all over. Like it just, even before it hit my stomach, it was like recharge. Wow. And unless you've been through this, like I know people don't believe it who haven't been through it, but I'm telling you, it's real. Like I felt it down my throat, hit my stomach. And it was like, mm -hmm. it's like the whole time is like being recharged, like a battery being plugged into a wall socket. And I was physically shaking. And wow. I could not believe how much better I felt within two seconds. Like, oh my God, I'm alive. I am not a corpse. There's actually some energy here. And I had to go lie on the couch because I was shaking so bad. And then of course I just had to melt down and that was it. So from that point forward was like, I'm going to have to just do something so different and it's going to be so hard and I'm not going to like this. And it really took about 18 months to feel like an okay person again, because it it's really, you're just, your world collapses. It's like, who am I? What is my place in the world? What do I think about any of this anymore? Like, it, it, is any of it true? All this stuff I believed, it all just, and then my place in the cosmos, ultimately, like, what is this universe then? If I have to kill animals to live, I don't want to live here. Like, this is a terrible world. Um, and it's not a terrible world. It's not, it's a beautiful place, the planet. This is it. It's, uh, for all we know, this is the only place that life exists. But all life eats life. That's literally how it works. And I just ran from that as hard as I could. And you have to face it at some point. I wish that when I was four, I had had that sort of talk with my elders and they had explained it to me. But I, you know, I don't live in that culture where that is knowledge that we have. No, it's but I not. Didn't, I didn't have it and I had to learn it. And you look around and now I see, yes, every single plant outside my window is eating dead animals. 
that's what soil is, is dead plants and animals. Honestly, one of the best visuals that I have. I mean, I love that story. I'm glad you told it. I know it's for our audience, <laughs> but I loved reading that in your book, hearing, I mean, every part of your step. But when you break down, I mean, when you really go through the journey of understanding how death is so a part of life. <laughs> and I think there's one part in the book that really stuck out to me where you talk about how a tree grew over um, a body. Of a, yeah. uh, honestly, that has never left my mind since I read the book. Um, but yeah, I mean, wow, the insights you had to hit. So you felt it right away oh, yeah. before it even hit your stomach. And then yeah. so now you have to deal with it psychologically, but, yeah. but physically you're ready, you're in. Yeah. So, so how did that go? So what do you eat now? How do you implement your way of eating now? Well, an another key point for me was, so now there's all this massive confusion, like, what do I eat? What does it mean? How do I find the good stuff? What is the good stuff? Um, and I very luckily uh, stumbled onto the Western Christ Foundation. They have such great information about traditional nutrition, why it matters, what's good about animal products. This whole world opened up for me. And it was one of those things, too, where it's sort of serendipitous, like where the universe is maybe handing you something that you need. Because I had two people within like a 48-hour period say, you know, I'm reading this really interesting thing, and you might really like it. And it's called Weston Price Foundation. I was like, what? And then the same thing happens where another person says, I think you might really be. I'm like, what? Okay, I've heard this twice. Now, what is this? So I got the Sally Fallon book and was just completely blown away. I was like, well, this was written for me. So then at least I had a set of principles and there was a whole way to understand what I was doing and why I was doing it and why it was good, like why it was going to help me, the kinds of things to look for. And then this whole journey starts of, oh, this is how we can repair the planet too. If it's all grass-based farming, now it makes sense. We can restore soil and we can restore the water table and we can you know, save the local waterways, the rivers and the creeks, and there's a habitat for animals again, and for songbirds, and for, you know, like everything gets to come home, because we're going to restore all of this, and sequester carbon, and support rural communities, like all, it's all of a piece, and I loved that, it was like, this is what I thought I was doing as a vegan, was repairing all of this, and it wasn't true, but here, like I can actually do that by doing these things, and it's the good nutrition for people. So now I had a framework again, which was incredibly helpful. For that first like year and a half, maybe I stumbled along like, I don't know, what am I going to do? I guess I'll go to the health food store and buy what they have there and hope it's better than factory farming. Um, but with the Sally Fallon information with the Western Price stuff, it's like, oh, I really now have kind of a set of principles and what I'm looking for. And I'm lucky because I, I lived in a rural area then and, and I moved, but I still live in another rural area. So super easy for me to raise my own animals to find other really good farms nearby even like the local farmers markets all really great stuff um the local natural food store has a range of local grass-fed you know products that are made right here in my county eggs are really easy to find if i don't have chickens right now i, I have in the past but i don't have them right now and so it's just really great to be able to get stuff easily easily but you know the key word here is pasture raised grass-fed um, another really great website, if people don't know it, is Jo Robinson, and, and her website is called eatwild.com. And you can click on your state, and there's just a list of all the grass-based farms. Um, and it's really great because most of these people are really excited to talk to consumers. Uh, you can go visit. You can see the kinds of lives the animals live. It was so important to me when I started eating milk um, and dairy products to be able to go to those farms and see the cows and the calves and the grass and meet the farmer and all of this. And it was like... This is good. This like feels really good. The animals are so happy. And I can see that the soil is doing really well. It's covered in grass all the time. Cows are just wandering around having their lives. Like it just all seems really perfect. One of the farms I started buying from is so cool. They don't even use um, like a tractor. They have draft horses and they harvest their own hay for the winter. There's no fossil fuel at all involved in their farm. The draft horses were amazing. I love horses anyway, but it was so fun to see them, the draft horses. Like these, these people are serious and they make incredibly good raw milk cheeses. And then I understood why raw milk was important. So it all came back together and probably repaired my body to the extent that it can be repaired. But it's also good to know I'm repairing the web of life. I'm repairing the planet and, and helping those farmers and just doing all the good stuff. Yes, absolutely. And thank God for those people yeah. who are out there right now 
you know, ranchers and farmers yeah. who are producing yeah. in a healthy way for our planet and for the animals and taking care of them and us. It's huge. I'm glad you brought up that both resources, actually. We had Sally Fallon on also. She's amazing. But I mean, the whole foundation is great. Yeah. Um, so, so are there any foods, you mentioned soy, which is a huge one, and you mentioned the evils of vegetable oils. Are there certain foods now that, well, clearly you, you're looking for well, well taken care of animals and organic foods. Um, are there foods that you're avoiding for good now? Yeah, so also I have three different autoimmune diseases. I forgot to mention that and what went wrong. Um, so gluten-free, absolutely, no matter what. That is huge if you have an autoimmune disease. And that really helped with the autoimmune stuff. It was, just, it was massively helpful to just take out gluten altogether. Um, and I also do my best just to avoid grain entirely. There, to me, there's no reason to eat it. So um, the problem, of course, is that it, it is fairly addictive and you know, little treats now and then. But um, as long as I stick to basically no grain, um, and absolutely no matter what, no gluten, uh, I do a lot better. So, and that's really true for a lot of people with autoimmune stuff because it's the plant lectins and the um, molecular mimicry that, you know, your immune system gets confused. A lot of the compounds that are in grains, especially gluten, look like different tissue in the body. And that is how the autoimmune process sort of gets kicked off for a lot of us anyway, for sure. So I, I try to avoid all that sort of that whole realm of food just isn't really food to me. And other than that, it's like, yeah, it's, I'm just so lucky. I have grass-fed beef. I live right on the coast, so I get really, really good seafood. We have salmon and tuna fish and stuff here, crab. Um, and there's also some really nice dairy farms in my, right in my area. And we actually have a cheese factory in my town, which is really fun. So you can go to the cheese factory and get, um, they do a really great job sourcing local grass-based dairy to make their cheese so pretty much anything you buy there is good and they have some raw varieties as well so and it's really cheap because it's right here um and i just feel so lucky to have that because i know other people are paying two and three times as much to have the kind of food that i can get really yeah i know you're blessed for sure and it's great really am. Yeah, and you're supporting i mean you're continuing like you said you're doing the work that you thought you were doing before <laughs> by sustaining yeah, yeah the people and the farms around you that's amazing so uh dairy is a little addictive too though i find it it's part of the animal yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> but i love gluten, it the gluten has the gluteomorphin problem that it turns into gluteomorphins in your intestines and the the dairy can do caseomorphin it's the same kind of thing and I, I don't know whether it works that way for me i don't find it like addictive i do really love it yeah <laughs> um, and, but i also i figure that given my sort of ethnic ethnic, ethnic background way farther near your northern europe is, is me um, i mean we've been eating dairy forever mm -hmm. so it doesn't surprise me that i do really well on dairy products it's in there for sure. So I'm, I'm happy. If I could ever try reindeer milk, I'd love to, but <laughs> nobody does that here. I'll have to go to Sweden to get that. Yeah, I haven't had that experience yet here in Canada either. Although I feel like if it's anywhere, it should be here. I know, right? North. <laughs> yeah, way far north. <laughs> but um, so in terms of, uh, not that, yeah, I mean, you didn't bring up fasting per se, but you did mention how, you know, it was really hard with your blood sugar is constantly going through the roller coaster to manage. So now you manage fine if you miss a meal. Do you intentionally yeah. miss a meal? Do you? No. Well, I don't tend to eat dinner just because I don't. Oh, I didn't even mention this one. I also ended up with another condition that's called um, gastroparesis. And my stomach doesn't make enough um, uh, um, hydrochloric acid to, to digest my food properly. So, I mean, I spent almost 20 years feeling sick semi-constantly. It was like every time I ate, it just sort of bloated and it didn't go anywhere. Um, and it's an interesting story because I was on, after I sort of came out of all of this and I found the Western Price stuff, I back in the day before there was Facebook and we had online forums, which I mean, I don't think anybody even does anymore, but um, there was one that was for Western Price people that I stumbled upon and I joined it. And I was like, I spent hours on that forum. So many people on there were also recovering vegetarians and vegans. I would say at least half of us. But there was so much good information and you could ask basic questions and lots of people were always willing to answer. So it was really, really fun, very informative. I felt really supported. Um, and there was a doctor on there. So uh, various people were talking about, oh, I have these stomach problems. And I was like, oh, I'll try. So I said, you know, I have this problem too where I eat and I just feel really sick no matter what I eat and I'm really bloated afterwards and I can't eat at night at all because I just feel sick the whole next day. And this guy that I didn't, I didn't even know him. He was a, um, a chiropractor actually from 
like Ohio, maybe. Anyway, he sent me a private message and he's like, you're the one that was the long-term vegan, right? That's before I'd written my book. And I was like, yeah, 20 years. He's like, I know what's wrong with you. It's called this, like this supplement. Talk to me in a week. You're going to feel so much better. And I was like, all right, free medical advice. I'll take it. And I went to the store and I bought the um, betaine hydrochloride and you take four with every meal. And within 48 hours, I was like a new person. I wrote him back right away. I was like, I don't know who you are, or like what kind of weird magic that was, but it worked. He's like, yeah, I'm going to explain what you did to yourself because I see this in my patients all the time. So that's it. And when you're on that blood sugar roller coaster, um, you're wrecking your, your, your body's ability to respond at all to anything because it's just too extreme. But one of the things that you're suppressing is uh, your body's ability to create hydrochloric acid because when you're in that um, the, it's too high moment, uh, and your body uh, produces all that, um, the, the insulin from your pancreas to get your blood sugar back down. Another thing that your body also produces is adrenaline because that helps to get it out of your bloodstream. The problem is that, you know, our bodies aren't designed to produce that level of adrenaline over and over again. So you're kind of wearing out that mechanism. Um, and the other problem is that, uh, you know, over time, one of the things adrenaline does is sends all your energy to the big muscles so that you can do fight or flight, right? It's supposed to be, you know, a tiger is coming to attack you and, you know, you're supposed to be having this emergency response. So that's what adrenaline does. But one of the ways that it does that is by shutting down your digestive system. So all the energy that your digestive system should be using, you don't need to deal with that now. You'll deal with it later. Right now, fight off the tiger. And so adrenaline, one of the things it does is it shuts down um, your stomach's production of hydrochloric acid that's why there wasn't enough hydrochloric acid and if you do that over and over again eight times a day um, you'll eventually damage that entire mechanism and that's what I did so to this day I still take that supplement and it really helps but I still can't really eat late at night I have a cutoff point of like five o'clock at night and it's not for like fasting reasons though I understand intermittent fasting but I don't do it for that reason I just do it because I can't digest my food that late at night and it doesn't go anywhere and I wake up feeling really sick I forgot to mention, yes, that's another problem I got from being a vegan that is not really repairable. It, it has helped some. I mean, it's, I don't need to take it at every single meal, but if I don't take it for a while, it starts to come back. So, you know, it's, I think it's one of those things that's semi-permanent. Um, and I can never quite eat to fullness. Like if I eat a really big meal, I, can, I just can't. I have to cut off before other people are done because I know that if I hit a certain level of um, feeling fall, it's like this isn't going to end well. This is going to be like 12 hours of feeling pretty nauseated. I just sort of cut it off. It's just a drag because it's just there's the comfort in just being full, <laughs> like, and it's not an experience I really get without knowing that a lot of pain is coming. So I just can't do it. Anyway, who knows? Maybe in another decade that'll be completely repaired. But it, it's certainly better. But it's not. It's not gone. So that's yeah. And I don't do other kinds of fasting. Like I did try once to do a three day fast, and honestly, I think that I, I think the vegan thing just killed it. Like I'm, I'm too exhausted generally. Um, because I did that three day thing and then I spent a week in bed. I was so exhausted. I, I literally couldn't sit up. And I, like at one point I almost went to the ER. I was like, I don't know what I've done here, but this is not normal. Like nobody should be this tired. I have permanently broken something. Maybe they can help me. I didn't go because I was like, I don't even know what they're going to like, Oh, I was a vegan and now I'm not. And you're not going to understand any of this. I was like, oh, you'll just be better in a few days, but it really took that long. And of course all the acupuncturists will say, you should never fast. There's nothing here for you to draw on. Don't bother. Just keep eating red meat, especially liver. <laughs> like that's, that's our only prescription. Um, so I shouldn't even have tried it. So I don't do all of that, but I certainly know people who do who derive great benefit from intermittent fasting, from, you know, occasionally doing a three day fast or a five day fast. I understand the principles, people's, you know, blood, lipid levels and all that improve. There's weight loss, all of that stuff seems good on paper. It is not for me. Yeah. Well, it's a good thing that you know that though. It sounds like you're really <laughs> much more in tune with yeah. your body than you were for so long, right? Yes. Um, very much so. So yeah. even just knowing when to stop eating and knowing that you yeah. can't get full and oh man, wow, what you've been through. I know. So, <laughs> It does sound like there's a lot of, and I pray in 10 years you have even more benefit um, or yeah. sooner, but it does sound like you've had a lot of good things come about with your health since you've changed your way of eating. <laughs> Definitely sounds yeah, like I mean, it impacts with you. There's some stuff like after a decade or two, you're not going to get it back. But there's definitely stuff that like pretty immediately you'll feel better. Like the blood sugar thing was instantaneous. 
I mean, it was like, wow, what have I been living with? It's terrible. Those highs and crashes. I mean, you just don't even realize how bad you feel emotionally. It's like, how did I live with that craziness every day? And oh, that's that's instant. Um, another right. one, and it comes back really quickly. Like yeah. you said, as soon as you eat those things, you're like, wow, I'm there oh, again. Yeah. Fat and protein. Who knew? Yeah. So that one, you know, you'll feel that one like within eight hours, you're going to feel really different. So that's, that was a good one. Um, I also, from being a vegan, I had this horrible dry skin. It's of course, you know, what is your skin built from? Um, and it, I didn't even realize how bad it was. It would keep me up at night. Like I'd be itching and it would just ache in the winter. Just so bad. And two days, three days, maybe into eating eggs. Eggs are amazing. Um, I was like, that was the first thing I started eating when I stopped being a vegan was eggs. And it was like, I can move my arms and legs and it doesn't hurt. Like it, that was amazing. Like, wow. It doesn't hurt to have skin. I had no idea that that wasn't normal. It just seemed like an everyday problem. It's, it's not crazy. like you're not supposed to hurt just from moving your arms and legs. So my skin could stretch again and my complexion looks completely different. So it's crazy. It's just astounding how unaware we are. <laughs> like constantly bless you like how constantly unaware we are not only of our own physical manifestations of unhealthy things but also how significant what we're putting into our mouth hole yeah. constantly is <laughs> because it's like so many of us have no idea and still to this day unfortunately so many people have no idea what they're putting in their mouth like that protein and fat would be so significant no clue right well some of the problems too that you have going on these kinds of diets is you're not going to get them on the first day. Like if all of this had happened to me, you know, by the first week, I would have stopped. It's like, well, that's clearly obvious. But yeah. when it takes months or years for the, you know, the deficiencies to kind of catch up with you, you don't know that that's what it is. Yeah. And of course, you know, you've built up the whole sort of ideological wall against knowing it. That's, that doesn't help. But also just the sort of slow creep of the degeneration, you don't realize what it is. It's, and so you go to doctors and they don't ask, what are you eating? It's like, oh, well, luck of the draw. You got some bad stuff. All right, well, I'll just keep being a vegan because that's the good thing. Yeah. So, I mean, it's great that you've had so many benefits already to your health, although it sucks how many things yeah. have not <laughs> involved. Um, but so I guess if there's anything else you'd love to share with us about changes physically since this new way of eating, we'd love to hear. But also just in life overall, if you've noticed differences stepping into this new way of eating um all of my problems got somewhat better from eating a more appropriate human diet some of them like my spine is not coming back but i am in dramatically less pain than it was so you know i'll take that it's i'm not going to get a complete cure but i will certainly take less pain and more function and a, a bigger life rather than a smaller life it's that's fine and you just you know you just have to move on like it's well, I had one set of cards and I played them and I didn't necessarily play them well, but it's, it's the way it is. So life is still fine. You know, there's still goodness in the world. So what do you, you know, what are you going to do? So, and that's one of the reasons I wrote the book was, you know, they talk about your survivor mission. Like when you've been through a bad thing, um, that a lot of people, part of their healing process is you take that on as a problem. Like, all right, well, this happened to me. How do I help other people either avoid that problem or, you know, how do I make a change so that it's easier for the next people who come through this? And that was definitely, and still is to some extent, my survivor mission was, God, if I can just help some of these ideologic, you know, idealistic young teenagers not do what I did, there's a better way to institute those values in your life. It's not being a vegan because you're going to end up with these problems. And to the extent that I've helped do that, I, it's, it's worth it. Like it's, I helped somebody great that that was what I wrote the book for. And that, that helps me to know, like, okay, it wasn't all for nothing. Um, so that's all good. Uh, and then I think it's just that general sense that the food that I eat is, is, is helping to repair the planet is always just an incredibly meaningful thing to me that we're sequestering carbon and that if we could get everybody to understand this process, we could stop global warming. We could do it. Like, it's not too late. Like, we just need to get more people literally on the ground to understand this. Um, and that's the biggest survivor mission now, right? Like our planet's really in peril, but it's not too late. And the, and the, the way out isn't that hard. Like we don't even have to do anything that's wretched. Like just do something really good, repair the soil, repair the biome, repair the biotic community, make a home again for all of those animals, the creatures, the bacteria, everybody, the plants, they can all come back. They want their homes back, give them their homes back. And there's really good food for humans on top of it. And then the farmers can earn a living and they don't have to be dependent on the government. And 
all these rural communities can make a living again. And like, there's just so many ways that we can make this better and sequester the carbon. So I, I like that. I like that there's this really good work to be done and that we have solutions that, that anybody can understand within, you know, a half an hour, an hour of talking, you can get them to understand the framework of it. It's very, very hopeful to me and we need hope because things are bad. So I just want everybody to get on board and we can do it. I love that. Oh, and your survivor mission, I mean, undoubtedly, not only the impact on me personally and the people in my life um, that I've been able to share what I've learned from your book or your book with, but I mean, in our Meter X community, your name comes up all the time, your book Aww. and the knowledge you've shared. And it's, uh, as I said at the beginning, it's, we have no idea how many people you've impacted, but you're definitely, your mission is, is underway. So Okay. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank thank you. you. And we're working with you on the mission of getting people to know about yeah. how we can do this because you're right. We can do this. It's not too late and it can be pleasant. It yeah. doesn't even have to be something that we're anxious about. We can do no, this with joy. It's um, all good stuff. Like every single yeah. step of this means something good for all of us, for the planet, for the people, for the animals, everybody has helped. So like, let's just do it. It's not that hard. And it really depends on all of us. Like, okay, I write books, but there's, you know, your podcast, there's so many of these really great podcasts now of people really getting out into, you know, into the, the airwaves and, and getting this information to as many people who will listen. It's so important and it's such an incredible grassroots effort. And I'm just so pleased to be even a small part of it. It's, it's not too late. And it wouldn't be the same without you. So oh. just thank you so much for everything. Thank you, thank you for coming to speak with us. Yeah, thank you for inspiring us with sharing your story. So honestly, with the learning that you provide, ugh, again, I could just, all the things I learned from your book, but thank you so much for coming to speak with us here at Meter X. It was okay. such an honor to meet you, Lier. You too. Thank you. Thank you so much. Feel okay, bad. Bye. You too. <laughs> bye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.